Hey guys, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Becca and today I am starting a book diary for Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. So if you've seen one of my book diaries before, you will know that it is a spoiler filled vlog. As I am reading the book, I will go through and I will tell you what I think of specific scenes. So if you have not read Game of Thrones and you don't want to be spoiled, then I would recommend that you skip this video. As you guys know, I am hosting a read along for the A Song of Ice and Fire series. We're reading one book every two months and I'm really excited because I really love the show and I want to see how the books differ because I think that they do, not a great deal in maybe the first couple of books, but later on there are quite a few differences. So I have started this and I have read two chapters and the first one is the prologue and I got I have to admit like I read the prologue and I was like so bored and I was like great I'm gonna hate this I'm gonna hate the book that I have to read the entire series for for my own read-along however I feel like the reason that I hate the prologue or I was bored by the prologue is that I tried to watch Game of Thrones three times before I finally committed to it and I just couldn't make it through the first 10 minutes, which is essentially what is depicted in the prologue of this with the three rangers of the Night's Watch going over the wall and like White Walkers and that stuff. But then I read the next chapter, which is chapter one from Bran's perspective, where they find the direwolf pups. And I was like, oh my God, the direwolf pups. I love it. And I remember having that reaction in the TV show as well. And then, well, we all know what happens with the direwolves, don't we? So um, it, it's good, but it's also, it's gonna be bad. So I'm, I'm hooked now, I'm really excited to carry on. I am reading this during my lunch at work. So until I make this like my priority read, you're probably gonna get like daily or like a couple of daily summaries of the section that I've managed to read while I was at work. I did notice some foreshadowing and I can't remember who says it. I need to stick a tab in now that I'm home and I need to start taking my tabs to work. But when they find the pups, somebody comments that it's surprising that she managed to give birth, consider like the mother of the wolves. Somebody suggested that maybe she was already dead when they were born. And somebody who is in that party then says that they're born from death and that's a bad omen. And I don't want to spoil it because I know there are a few people taking part who haven't read the show, uh, who haven't read the show, who haven't watched the show or read the books before. If you have, then you know that that is indeed a bad omen for this family. So I really, I was excited to see some foreshadowing already and I'm so glad that I watched the show before I read the books because if I didn't, I would have to read the books, watch all the show and then read the books again to get all of that foreshadowing. So my camera battery is now flashing at me so that's pretty much it for this update. I'm gonna go stick that little tab in there for the foreshadowing moments. I am going to try and color code annotate this, which I've never done before. I normally just stick in tabs to my favorite quotes. But we're gonna see how that goes and I'm hoping that this is gonna be a really fun book diary because I think that these books are gonna be really dense and have a lot of content in them and things in them that I really wanna talk about. Okay, so it has been about a week since I've given you an update on A Game of Thrones, but I am only on page 64. I haven't read a lot at all. I do want to remedy that. I want to be focusing on this a lot more and I will be very soon. But for now, I just wanted to tell you a couple of my thoughts. So I'm up to the part where Catelyn and Ned have just had the discussion and Ned doesn't want to go and be the Hand of the King but Catelyn does want him to which is fucking stupid in my opinion and she's received a letter from Lysa that says that Lysa thinks that Cersei killed Jon or she knows that Cersei killed Jon and in Catelyn's head that's more of a reason that Ned should go to King's Landing, which doesn't make any sense. That would be a reason for him to say no, in my opinion. I mean, if Cersei's not threatened by him, then she's not gonna kill him. So I have been annotating this and I just wanted to go through like the points that I'm annotating. So if you can see this, we have the blue stripy ones are foreshadowing and then the spotty ones are history. So important points in the history of the world. And then pink is plot points and clues. So, so far there is actually a point of foreshadowing that I missed at the beginning. So I think I spoke to you about the one with the wolves that says that it's a bad omen that all of the dire wolves were born in death and the Starks aren't the most fortunate family. <laughs> but what I didn't pick up on is that the dire wolf's mother was killed by a stag and the House Stark banner is a dire wolf and the House Baratheon banner is a stag. And honestly, it took Catelyn picking up on that to make me realise that that was a thing. But that was really interesting. So I've marked that point. 
and then just the point um where Lysa sends a letter so that's all I've done so far but I did only like start annotating recently I had to go back and put some tabs in the only thing that surprises me about this as well is the ages of all of the characters because I think I think Daenerys is 13 John and Rob are 14, is Sansa 11, Arya's about 9, Bran's 7 or 8 and Rickon's 3. Now I don't know if there's a time jump in there but I remember in the show that the direwolves are a lot older by the time the king's party rolls in than they are when they find them under pups. So I'm guessing like at least a little bit of time has passed but at this point I'm pretty much just ignoring their ages because I'm picturing them like the characters in the show and like I don't want to think of Jon Snow and Robb Stark as like 14 year olds okay like you you know that I don't. So I don't know if there's like an actual time jump in the books or whether they are supposed to be such a young age. I mean that does fit with a fantasy timeline because in really archaic high fantasies and more traditional high fantasies and also in like history girls were married and having kids when they were like 13 14 and people didn't live as long so people were treated like adults a lot younger but you know i just i don't i don't feel like like it's necessary in a fantasy setting to be just like oh well it fits this time period for it to be like this because fantasies aren't set in real places so the the rules of that society could be anything you don't have to be marrying kids off when they're 12. it doesn't have to be a thing so that's pretty much all I have to say at the moment. I'll check in with you when I get a little bit more to talk about. I'm hoping to be prioritising this very, very soon. I'm reading one more book this month that's over 500 pages and then I have a couple of short books and then I'm free to dedicate some time to this. It is currently about the, I think it's the 15th of January. So I still have almost two and a half weeks left of the month and I'd like to get to around page 400. Hey, so I've been reading some more Game of Thrones. I'm still only on page 120 though, like it is slow going. However, despite that, look at all these tabs I have. I think I have about 15 already, which is, it's insane. The few chapters I've read since the last time that I updated you are kind of just continuing to set things up, like nothing super intense is happening. They've all now left to go to King's Landing, they're on the road. Tyrion and Jon have headed to the wall and they're on the way there but there's just like there's a couple of chapters that I found very interesting and the first one is one of Ned's chapters where he's on the road with Rob. Rob is needling him about who John's mother is and he says that her name is Willa but doesn't really want to talk about her and then a little bit later on Robert is going on and on about Liana Ned's sister and saying like oh how many times did you think that Eris or was it Rhaegar I think it's Rhaegar isn't it yeah how many times do you think Rhaegar Targaryen raped her and Ned's like having a flashback to his sister Liana saying promise me Ned I don't want to spoil it because I don't know like you guys who are watching this that are taking part in the catch-up book club I don't know if you've watched the show but I know what all this stuff is alluding to and I'm just if you watch the show you know what I mean and that was always like I always had that theory down like I knew that that was the case so I'm enjoying that and I'm enjoying like picking out the clues that allude to stuff that I already know later on and then in Tyrion's chapter that directly follows which is where he's on the road to the wall he is say he's talking about his obsession with dragons and how when the Baratheons first took the keep in King's Landing he went looking for the dragon skulls because he like loves dragons and he found the skulls of like the first three on the most legendary three dragons and he's talking about how one of his ancestors and another lord or they were kings at the time banded together to try and take down Aerys. Is it Aerys the Mad? Aegon the Mad? Yeah, Aegon the Mad. So he's talking about how his ancestor and this other king banded together to try and take on Aegon Targaryen back in the day like about 300 years I think he said and how they had these three big dragons which obviously parallels Daenerys and her three big dragons and that they were the biggest dragons that have ever been and the longer time goes on the smaller and more deformed the dragons are getting. Now I was really interested in that it didn't say anything that I would think foreshadowed like a repetition of history with Daenerys and her dragons coming in and saving like the day and taking over like those three dragons did but I'm thinking that that's going to be alluded to at some point but what I really want to know and I don't think it's like touched upon in the show either is that it's mentioned a lot of times like it is mentioned in the show that the dragons get more sickly and smaller the longer like they went on so the last dragons were tiny and they were deformed and I want to know what it is 
that has done that to them because Danny's dragons are fine and I've just got to the bit where she's been gifted the eggs and they're very old eggs that have turned into stone supposedly I don't know whether that is actually the case so what is it was it something to do with being in King's Landing and being in Westeros was it the environment like what is it that made the dragons just become weaker and weaker until they eventually died out <laughs> that was a long discussion break I'll catch up with you when I've read a little bit more and I have some more things to discuss so I have read a little bit more of Game of Thrones and I'm up to the part where Catelyn has arrived in King's Landing which I don't remember her doing in the show but I guess I guess she did. It's been a while since I watched season one and Varys and Littlefinger have summoned her and they have told her that Tyrion Lannister is the one who owned the dagger that the assassin tried to kill Bran with but I'm pretty sure that it wasn't Tyrion because it's something to do with Cersei and Jaime so that's very intriguing because I don't really remember where that leads. We have also had the chapter where Bran has woken up and he is seeing visions like he can see what everybody's doing all at once and i know i was talking to the other co-hosts of this read along in the group chat and they asked if i'd been spoiled and i was like well i've seen the show so like can i be spoiled and they said that there's like a lot of visions and things in this and i'm wondering if that's what they meant because that was like super interesting because one thing that i still don't really understand from the show is like bronze powers and like what bronze deal is so it's interesting to get a little bit more into that still super enjoying this still really loving it hoping to dedicate a big chunk of my time to this soon because honestly every time I read it I just really want to power through and the chapters are really short so that's really inspiring because it doesn't like take me long to make progress. Okay so it's been a hot minute since I've done an update I am on page 264 now but there's like key things in the last three or so chapters that I want to touch upon and discuss with you guys. So the first thing is the Daenerys chapter. I think it's the third Daenerys chapter and it is essentially, I want to say that it's Daenerys's sexual awakening and the journey of her sexuality but to be honest it's pretty fucking grim. So it pretty much starts off with her getting raped repeatedly by Khal Drogo and then she gets to a point where she kind of just accepts it and she's like not hating it anymore but she's not into it all the time and then it comes to her taking the lead in their sexual relationship and I just like Daenerys is treated so poorly and I feel like in the show it is romanticized a little bit and the thing with her and Khal Drogo is set up to be more of a romance in the show than what it is hey so this is editing becca and i just wanted to pop in and say that since i filmed the clip and i've read this section um i've had the live show of game of thrones but before that i was talking to rachel who is a co-host of this read along and she said that the wedding night scene in the show is set up to be much more of a rape than it reads in the book so i was maybe wrong at least on that part about this but i definitely remember thinking that eventually Daenerys and Khal Drogo's relationship is very romanticized in the show but then like obviously later on in the books it is as well but essentially she gets sold to him by her brother who sexually assaults her regularly she's 13 as well and then she gets raped repeatedly by this big burly 30 year old and it's just it's grim you know it's grim and i'm wondering if the whole like her taking charge sexually in their relationship is more of a power thing because she is coming into herself as the Khaleesi and she is becoming more in control of her situation and realizing the power that she has as Khaleesi and I'm wondering if it's cementing that and also her then gaining power over Khal Drogo and then at the end of that chapter she finds out on her 14th birthday that she's pregnant which again is pretty grim so I just wanted to kind of like discuss her character arc so far and just like all of the terrible shit that's been done to her so the next things of note are in Bran's chapter that directly follows that Daenerys one and oh my god I had some things in here so I put like I, I have like 50 tabs in this I'm on like page 260 so the first thing of note I want to say is that there is a theory um that if you guys watch the show and are like really into it you probably know there's a theory that Bran is Bran the Builder and every Bran throughout history and there's a point in the book where old Nan seems to be getting him confused with either his uncle or his like great uncle Brandon Stark 
but it's made quite clear that Bran is like a family name and it is used throughout the generations. And then that is followed up by a point that I'm just going to read to you, which I found like this completely backs up that theory. Maybe one of the other Brandons had liked that story. Sometimes Nan would talk to him as if he were her Brandon, the baby she had nursed all those years ago. And sometimes she confused him with his uncle Brandon, who was killed by the Mad King before Bran was even born. She had lived so long, Mother had told him once, that all the Brandon Starks had become one person in her head. So, like, what if old Nan is the only one who actually has a clue what's going on? Because she's naturally old, like, most of her children are dead, and her grandson is dead, although some of them did fall in battle. Her daughters, who were married off and sent to safety, are all also dead. So I think that old Nan, like, knows a lot more than we give her credit for. Also, in this chapter, and I could be reaching here, but he asks for a story about the White Walkers and she tells him a story that strangely mirrors in the show where he goes to find the children of the forest and essentially this paragraph is a mirror image of what happens in the show. It says the last hero determined to seek out the children in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what armies of men had lost. He set out into the deadlands with a sword, a horse, a dog and a dozen companions. For years he searched until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died and his horse and finally, even his dog. And his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it. So I did tab that up as like, I have a tab note for War and Legend. So I did put that under that, but essentially, like Bran in the show is not one of my favorite characters. I don't really care about him because he is doing all this stuff and it's clear that he will pay, play an integral part, but I'm not really sure what that is at the minute. So I, I'm not like overly fond of him, but his chapters are super, super interesting. There's also this quote in the chapter by Tyrion that I really, really love. And it says, your brother John asked it of me and I have a tender spot in my heart for cripples and bastards and broken things which I really liked. So they're like the things of note that I've read the most recently. I'm still really, really loving this and I'm surprised at how much I am loving it, but literally like I just can't wait to read it all the time and I'm just so absorbed. We are coming into February. It's the 30th of January as I'm recording this section and I'm, I'm gonna switch this to my priority book. I have about 60 pages of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And then I'm literally just gonna read through all this and I'm gonna have a Bookopoly book as my secondary book. So I'm really, really loving this so far and I can't wait to bring you guys some more updates. Hey, so it's been a hot minute since I have checked in. I don't even remember what page I was up to the last time I did an update, but I am now on page 510. So I know it has been a while, maybe, maybe 200 pages. But to be honest, I've been feeling like the whole middle section is really, really slumpy. For example, I've read probably about this much today. So if you take that away and you compare how many tabs I have up here, compared to how many I have throughout these pages, you'll see how my engagement and interest in what's happening in these pages has been a lot less involved than what's happening up here. So I thought I'd come back and do a check-in at the moment because there are a couple of things that have happened that I am eager to talk about. I'm currently up to the point at page 510 where Ned has just been captured. He thought the gold cloaks were on his side, but it turns out they're not. And Littlefinger says like, I told you not to trust me. But not long before that, we had a Daenerys chapter. I think it was Daenerys 4 or Daenerys 5. And it is the chapter that I remember vividly from the show. And it's just such a badass, like a moment of badassery on the part of the Dothraki and it is when they pour the molten gold over Viserys' head and was like, here's your crown. I absolutely loved that. Although I do think that Danny's attitude, like in the book as opposed to the show, in the show she seems to be quite scared of him as she quite rightfully should be. But in the book, she seems to have more of a sense of responsibility to him. Like she does still fear him and there is definitely that present because he is a dick but she also seems to have this notion of he is my only living family, like he's an asshole, but I'll have nobody if he dies. So I'm interested to see how that's gonna play out in the later chapters and how she feels about Viserys' death. But what I really wanted to talk to you guys about is that I read a Ned chapter and it was the one where King Robert comes back and he's dying. 
no there's a very interesting thing within eddard because we all want to believe as i'm assuming that as readers a lot of you guys like me are idealists or daydreamers you like to believe in the classic fairy tales of princesses and knights and like your knight in shining armor and things like that and ned is like the picture image like he is the ideal of the knight in shining armor he is everything that we want from a hero. He's just, he's loyal, he has honour, he always does the right thing as opposed to what would gain him an advantage. And it's very painfully clear, especially in that chapter, I have like had inklings of it as I've been going along, but especially in that chapter, I can pinpoint every time that Ned made the wrong decision and it's painful and it's ironic because every decision he makes is the right decision as in what is right and what people should do but for his own well-being and the well-being of his of his family and the sake of his life i can see everywhere he's going wrong so in that chapter alone he makes two mistakes and the first mistake that he makes is turning renly away when renly says to capture the children and hold them hostage so that cersei will do what they like because they have possession of her children and he says no i'm not kidnapping children don't be stupid, that's not who I am. And then a few pages later, Littlefinger comes to him and Ned explains that he sent a letter to Stannis to tell Stannis that he is the rightful king as Robert has no legitimate children. So Stannis should come back and take the throne and Littlefinger's like, I don't think you should do that because Stannis is a lot more cruel than Robert was. The best thing to do would have Joffrey as the king, but sort of take him under your wing to be a better king than he is going to be if left unchecked and Ned says, no because joffrey isn't the king by blood he's a bastard i'm not gonna do that and if he had taken any of those roads even though they are not the right thing to do then he may still be alive and his children won't be in danger and it's just like it it's a little bit sad because the honorable people and the noble people in real life as well you do the right thing but nobody cares the fall of house stark is essentially because they all do the right thing but they're playing the game of thrones with people who will do anything and stop at nothing to get what they want and they know that the Starks are not going to make those ruthless decisions because their house mantra is honour and doing the right thing and being noble and being good and that is ultimately their downfall and that's really sad because though they have like the best traits like the ideal traits for a hero so it's just it's really sad there is actually a quote in here that sums up all that of that that I've just said and it is Littlefinger who says it. You wear your honour like a suit of armour, Stark. You think it keeps you safe, but all it does is weigh you down and make it hard for you to move. It's just so true, like, that his honour, which is something that should keep him safe, because as long as he's doing the right thing, like, how can bad things happen to people doing the right thing? Like, it's... That's what you think, but everything that he's done that's honourable is what leads to his capture and eventually his death. So like I said yesterday, where I could pinpoint every mistake that Ned had made that had led him to the inevitable downfall of himself and his killing and ultimately the fall of his house, I'm starting to pick up where it's happening to other people as well. I don't really want to talk too much about other books in the series, like I haven't read them but I know what happens because of the show, because I know there are a couple of people taking part in the read-along that have not watched the show and they're like reading and watching along at the same time. But there is a conversation between Catelyn and Rob where they are talking about Walder Frey and Catelyn says that his her father has never trusted him and that Rob shouldn't either and Rob says don't worry I won't and I've just read the Daenerys chapter where they sort of seize that tone and she is saving the women who are being raped by the blood riders and she gets to Khal Drogo and he is injured and a woman comes forward and says, I will heal you. And I'm pretty sure, I don't remember exactly what happens to Khal Drogo, but I'm pretty sure that that woman has something to do with Daenerys' child and Khal Drogo and the downfall of the Khalasar. So it's really interesting having this hindsight and being able to pick 
this out now. Strangely enough, I don't regret not reading the books before watching the show because a lot of the things I wouldn't pick up on if I was reading this for the first time with no concept of the story. So having the show as a reference is really, really great because otherwise I would have to read the entire series twice, which, you know, that's, that's a lot of books. It's a lot of pages. I'm currently on page 650 of 780 and i believe that this could be the smallest book of them all i mean the editions that i own storm of swords and dance with dragons are in two parts but i believe in the us they were printed as one whole book so they must be like absolutely enormous so just rereading one book would be like a lot so i can't imagine doing what ashley and cody are doing which is rereading the entire series and I think for Ashley it's not the first time either. So kudos to them because um, I think it's going to be a very long time before I reread Game of Thrones if I ever do and if I do it will probably be when the Winds of Winter is released and I want to do like a full reread and also a full rewatch of the entire show. So like I said I'm at page 650 now I think I'm going to put this down for a little while just to um, give myself a little bit of a clap palette cleanser. I don't like to read huge sections of this at once because I find that I don't retain as much information if I'm reading big chunks of this at once and obviously there's a lot to take in. So I'm going to put this down move on to something else and come back when I'm a little bit more refreshed. So Eddard is now dead and I have just read the chapter where Bran dreams that Ned is down in the crypts and he goes down there with Osha and Mr, is it Mr Lewin? There's the Winterfell maester. The maester is telling him like it's all just stories and it's all just like a dream and they go into the story of the children of the forest and how they came about which I found really interesting because I have found reading through this, if you can see with my tabs, there are many more up here than there are towards the end of the book. And I feel like that is because as somebody who has watched the show, the plot of the book and like the main plot events are exactly the same as they are in the show. Like the show is very true to the book. But the things that we don't get in the show are a lot of the stories and a lot of the lore and a lot of the history. Like knowing what I know from the most recent series of the show, which is something that I've kind of like, I've always hypothesized that it's true about John. Reading in this, all of the clues makes it super, super obvious. Things like that, like the history of what happened in the war where they deposed the Mad King and the Children of the Forest and the others or White Walkers is the most interesting part of this for me so I really enjoyed that chapter and I think it was surrounding Eddard's death it was the saddest chapter I've read so far where all of the wolves howl when the crow comes in that brings the news that Ned is dead. So that is probably one of my favourite chapters of the book so far. I have also just read the Sansa chapter that follows it and I think that this is the first chapter where Sansa gets a bit of a backbone. I know I put in the Goodreads group <laughs> that Sansa's naivete makes me want to smash my head against a wall and it really, really does. I've never liked Sansa. You could say that some of it is because I hold a grudge in generally. Like, um, I'm not saying like I do forgive people. I don't just like hold a grudge. I'm very forgiving, but I don't forget. And I always remember what an irritating little flea Sansa is in season one of the show. And a lot of people argue that she has her own strength. And I read a tweet not long ago that says like, oh, if you think that women need swords to be badass, think of Sansa Stark. But to me, it's just not the best way to go about it. Her brothers and Arya openly fight against the Lannisters. Like I know Arya disappears for a long time, but she is openly angry and wants revenge on the Lannisters. And Rob is fighting a war. Jon is stuck at the wall, but he still feels it. Bran and Rickon are children, but Sansa just pretends to go along with it the entire time. She, she does things for the Lannisters that I would not do, because I'm not, I'm not a person who pretends essentially like if i'm pissed off at somebody i'm like look what you've done is out of order and i don't appreciate it so i've never liked sansa's character but i do appreciate in that last chapter i read the little spark of defiance and her changing attitude towards joffrey now that she's finally opened her eyes and seen what's going on because essentially like ned would not have been arrested at the time that he was if it wasn't for sansa going to the queen and saying that her and Arya were being sent back to winterfell so I am appreciating her character a little bit more. I am hoping that the books will help me to 
like her character more because I even in I, I just don't like Sansa I just really don't like her which I think is an unpopular opinion because I think most people really do but my next chapter is a Daenerys chapter I think it's the last Daenerys chapter of the book I'm on page 626 so I have about 53 54 pages left and I am hoping to finish those today. So at some point I will check in with you with my final thoughts. Hey guys, so it has now been around a month since I finished Game of Thrones by George R. 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 Martin. And I was just editing my book diary, which I've been putting off for some time because it's kind of long. And I realized that I need to wrap up my thoughts. So I finished it, I gave it five stars. At this point the live show has been and gone, so I will link it up here if I have not linked it already. But I really love this. I love the complexity. I love how much value you can get out of it. If you know the storyline further on it seems very well crafted it seems quite complex or well it doesn't seem quite complex it is quite complex and i had a thoroughly good time reading this obviously i said that i can't really read huge chunks at a time because i do stop paying attention so that is like a little bit of a struggle but it's not because the book is bad and it's not absorbing it's just because there's so much to take in that if i'm reading 100 pages at a time then I'm starting, I'm not focusing as much by the end of that 100 pages as I was at the beginning and I need to just like slow down and take my time a little bit more, take it in the story. I want to mention George R. R. Martin's writing style a little bit because I find it very interesting. It's very impartial in places and he will sort of tell you what's going on but he will not tell you how to feel about it and you as a reader have to make your own mind up whether you are going to like certain characters or not and I think that you will notice in conversation with people about Game of Thrones everybody kind of has a different favourite character. There are people that even like the characters that are like the bad guys and that is because this is a story that contains a lot of morally grey characters. Everybody does unexcusable things but some of them are more liked than others and it's just I found that really interesting. I'm really excited to carry on with Clash of Kings. It's now about the 20th of March. I have not started it yet and I know that I desperately need to but I am very excited to continue on with this series and I'm excited to bring you more of my thoughts. So that's pretty much it for this book diary. Please let me know if you have liked it and also whether you checked out the live show. If you did like this video then please don't forget to give it a like and also subscribe if you want to. But that is it from me today guys. I'll see you in my next one. Bye! Oh, you bite your friend like chocolate You say you're a go When nobody knows With guns in under our petticoats We're never gonna quit it, no We're never gonna quit it, no